welcome you uh, this morning. And if you would take out your notes, we're going. To, the message today is called the Great Shaking. Could everybody say that? The Great Shaking. And there is a shaking coming up. Our scripture. Uh, that we're looking at the text and we're going to expound on this a little further <clears throat> but the heart of it is taken from Hebrews 12 26 the second part now he hath promised saying yet once more I shake not the earth only but also the heavens so let's pray father we commit this time to you Lord in your word that it would go forth it'll accomplish that which you please and it'll prosper to that which is sent we thank you for your word Lord and that you guide us in this life through that two-edged sword in the name of Yeshua Jesus our King Amen uh, you know we are living through very uh, tumultuous times and if you've been watching the news you know what's been transpiring in the, the, the country of Iraq, very prominent in the news since back in the early 2000s and the war that took place there and Saddam Hussein and all of that. And, uh, and now there is a significant shift that has just taken place over these last two weeks with a group called ISIS. It's an Islamic group, very radical, very brutal group of people. And they are now taking over the northern part of that country and the northern part of Syria, very significant. And uh, we are, I believe, living in the, the end times, the, uh, the end of the end times. They were, we're living in those days just before the coming of the Lord. And, and we need to give diligence to our seeking of the Lord in our life in general, knowing that He is coming soon. How, how many would believe that He's coming soon? It says He's coming soon. Now, we don't know what soon is exactly, but we do know that there are unfolding events that are are indicators of the coming of the Lord being sooner than we might have thought. And uh, this, uh, these events taking place uh, in Iraq, I think, are symptomatic of that, of that belief system. Now, in Matthew 24, we find Jesus' uh, most, most dramatic dissertation on what the end would be like. And we don't have time to go through all of that, but we just want to comment on some of the, uh, the symptoms of what it was going to be like just prior to his coming and in this particular set of scriptures Matthew 24 4 to 12 he said these things are the beginning of sorrows these are just preliminary to the coming of the Lord and and what we're dealing with today is that th this is this is a part of the great shaking because that shaking is going to be very comprehensive and it's going to be for those who don't know the Lord it's going to be very troubling if your heart is set on this world this is going to shake your timbers I'll tell you right now because the things that are going to be developing are going to be very troubling very challenging to us mentally and emotionally if our hearts not right with God and uh, uh, so there are I've gotten uh, four there, there are seven symptoms that are found in these scriptures that are going to be part and parcel of the world system in our lives things that we're going to be hearing about Number one, when Jesus said, you know, what is the sign of your coming? The first thing he said, be careful that you are not deceived. So deception was number one. He said, in the end times, there will be people who will bring deceptive words. They're false teachers, false prophets, false apostles. There will be false leaders in the church. Not only outside of the church, but in the church. He said, number one, be careful that you're not deceived. In another place, Jesus says, be careful how you listen. Because what you listen to is going to determine what you believe. And if your belief system is off, then we're in trouble as well. So number one was deception, and we could talk about that quite a bit in regard to what's transpiring in the, in the church at large. We'll touch on that in a few moments. Number two are wars and rumors of wars. And we see that all throughout the planet. There have always been wars and rumors of wars. But these, this is a, because this is a comprehensive list, all of these things are taking place at the same time. And we are nightly uh, given additional uh, information about groups of people that are nations that are at war or potentially going to be at war. Number three, it says nation against nation. Now when you look at that word nation, uh, the Greek word is ethnos. 
In other words, there'll be ethnic rivalry, ethnic hatred between groups of people and races and ethnic backgrounds. And we see that all across the planet. Just this division among people who are of different backgrounds, different skin colors, different origins and nations. We're seeing that. Ethnic strife. Uh, D is, is the death of Christians. It said, Jesus said this. He said, they're going to come and kill you. He said, they're going to hate you, but then they're going to kill you as well. Now you say, well, that's really not happening. Well, you're, you'd be wrong there because you'd have to add that to that. It's not happening yet in America. And I put that word yet in that, in that sentence. But in other nations, there is an eradication of Christians in the Middle East. In these nations, they said in Iraq, in Syria, there is an, a, a cleansing of Christians. They said they can no longer live there. Uh, this ISIS group said, you do not come back to your church. We'll kill you and we'll burn your buildings. It says do not return. More people, more Christians have been slaughtered in the last 10 years, or there's a period of time, and I want to be accurate, just recently, than there have been people martyred, Christians martyred, throughout history. In other words, this is coming to pass now in, in these nations of the world. And remember, just because we're Americans, it does not mean that these things are just going to be happening in America. Most of the events that will unfold in the end times will be in the region of the Middle East. It will be happening in uh, Israel and uh, in Egypt and Syria and Iraq and those nations. That's where much of the, of the end time prophecy will emerge. The events will take place there. The entire planet will be, it'll be affecting us. But it will not, all of them will not take place simultaneously and will not touch America the same way. Very important. Uh, false leaders and false prophets. We've already touched on that. But in the church, the Bible says in the last days, many are going to fall away from the faith. And when you do that, the result is you give heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of what? Yeah. Devils. Now those doctrines will be seeded out into the church. In other words, people in the, what we say, the church world, the Christian world, will come to believe certain doctrines that are absolutely not true. That's why we have to be very cautious of what we believe, that it's in the Bible and the person is not just telling a story about something, but that they are bringing truth from God's Word and, and not isolating a text, but putting the text in the context in developing, developing that, that doctrine, that belief, throughout the scriptures. F is, is lawlessness. Now, can I tell you this? In America, we are living in a lawless society. From the highest levels of our government down through the government, there is a lawless system. And uh, it is, is becoming more profound. And it seems to be that there are very few people who are going to take a stand regarding that lawlessness, or the, we might call it the breakdown of constitutional constitutional law. From the highest office in the land down through the governmental system, there is lawlessness. Now Jesus said that in the end times this lawlessness will abound and the love of many will wax cold. That word love comes from the Greek word agape, and that word is primarily uh, attributed to Christians. It's a, it's a love that comes from God. But because the end times, as they unfold, people will be so immersed in the events that are taking place in life that they'll begin to be so self-oriented that their love for other people is actually going to grow cold. And there will not be the cohesiveness, the, the Bible word for, for fellowship is koinonia. They'll not have that love one for another anymore simply because life will be so demanding that life becomes all about them and their survival so the love of many will wax cold we're already seeing that in the in the church world and G is uh, again the loss of the love for one another now it's very interesting that this the the events that have taken place over these last weeks very significant uh, Walid Shubat is a, an ex-terrorist Muslim and is now a dedicated, devoted man of God, has been for some years, and understands the Muslim world like very few people do. He just put out an article and he was showing that in the scriptures, and I don't have time to elaborate on this, we may do this on a Wednesday evening, that it is prophesied that Iraq will actually be divided into three parts. 
it will be divided into three sections. Now they are now talking about from the government and representatives that they are agreeing and believing that ultimately Iraq will cease to be a cohesive nation and will be three parts. The northern Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shiites. There will be three sections and they will be divided off. Iran then is a problem in the whole area, obviously very aggressive. And in his article he said he shows where that uh, Iran is actually can be understood and seen to be the bear is symbolically in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation is actually the bear. Now typically over time we've thought of the bear coming down and devouring as being Russia. But no time to take the, the uh, deal with the, the uh, details. But he said that is actually the bear. This is unfolding revelation I believe in these end times. He said and that bear devours three ribs and consumes them. If this is true and accurate, what we're seeing is something that is quite significant and moves us dramatically closer to the coming of the Lord. Because if Iran, who is very much more powerful than Iraq would be divided, comes in and then uh, defeats those three nations, that, that out of that conglomeration will come the caliphate. Now for those of you who are not familiar, there was a caliphate, was the last caliphate was back in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, many, many years ago, and I don't give you the exact dates on that, but I think it was uh, the late, about 1920 was the last caliphate was dissolved. The Ottoman Empire, which was fundamentally focused on uh, Turkey and that region of the world where Iraq is located. That they are seeking out a caliph a leader for the caliphate. A caliphate is just a region of the world that has come under Islamic rule and control and Shia, Shria law. In other words, the nation, that group is guided by one individual and that individual, the caliph, will be prominent in the end times. Now, in addition to that, in the Muslim religion, they are awaiting the arrival of a significant leader. And this leader is going to lead them against the Jews and all Christians and ultimately dominate the planet. They are believing that. They are waiting for that. They believe it will come at a time of, of chaos and peril across the planet. And out of that peril and out of that chaos will come this, this powerful anti-Muslim leader. He, he will be the caliph, the leader of the Muslim world, but he, he is also known as the 12th Imam or the Mahdi. Now listen very carefully. The 12th Imam or the Mahdi will be the Antichrist of, this, of the end times. That man, if you look into the, uh, the, the Quran and it describes this end time caliph or this end time, this Imam, he's a supernatural being by the way. He has his origins in the supernatural and he comes forth supernaturally just as the Antichrist does. And that he will be leading this great these armies against against Israel. They're waiting for that Imam to lead them. It will be the Antichrist, as most people are understanding at this point in time. So we need to watch the news very carefully to see what transpires with Iraq and Iran, knowing that these events are moving very rapidly and this great shaking is, is underway. Something very significant, oh by the way, when you take the book of, of the, uh, the uh, Quran and the description of the Imam and superimpose it over the Bible and the attributes of the Antichrist, they are one and the same. In other words, the, the Quran describes a man coming that is going to have the exact attributes as does the Bible's Antichrist as he comes forth. So we can be assured that that is where this man is going to emerge from. Many people think he's going to come out of the general region of, uh, uh, of Syria, out of that region. And then eventually Turkey becomes part of that this whole system. So we're moving very, very rapidly. Uh, one of the things about this Antichrist, uh, there's a demand that you take on the mark of the beast. And uh, without that mark, you can't buy or sell. And if you deny that and you 
resists him, the method of death is, guess what? It is beheading. This group coming down now, this splinter group, but it's a very power group, powerful group that's taking over Iraq, they are moving, they are the most brutal people. They are more brutal than Al-Qaeda and Hamas and all of those terrorist groups. They're coming down through there and they're doing this. They're just taking the heads off of people. They're just taking their heads off. That's another indicator. That's the only religion on the planet that beheads people. It's Islam. It's the only one. There's no other religion on the planet that takes heads off. They do it with impunity. Where did they get that? Well, they got it from Muhammad. Muhammad took the heads off of thousands of people, Jews and other unbelievers through his history, and it's come down through the, through the centuries. That is common in those regions of the world. Daniel 8.25, looking at your notes. Now after, there's something else is going to happen. When this war breaks out, there's going to be a war against Israel. And it's called the Gog and Magog War. And if you look at from uh, uh, Ezekiel, it describes the areas in the regions that are going to go to war against Israel. Describes them. Because every single one of those regions. Every one of those areas is Islamic. They're all Islamic. It's all of Islam. The Gog and Magog War. There will be a war against Israel. Because once this, caliph, this caliphate develops, their great and primary goal is to defeat Israel. Isn't that right? We've all known that over the years. They want to defeat Israel. And they, uh, they have a passion to destroy Israel. Now here's what happens. Immediately after that war, there's going to be a peace treaty signed. And that peace treaty will be signed and endorsed. And on that piece of that parchment, on that agreement, on that covenant, will be the name of the Antichrist. Gog and Magog war against Israel. At the end of that war, there will be actually a peace treaty made, but it will be in deception. Now, here's what Daniel says. And we're going to be studying more about this uh, in the coming weeks on Wednesday evenings. Daniel 8.25. And through his policy, also he shall cause craft or deceit to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and notice this, and what? By peace shall destroy many. In other words, Jews and, and people of God. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. That's God himself, Jesus. But he shall be broken without hand. In other words, without the hand of man. He's going to be, he will be destroyed. But he will exalt himself because he is indwelt by the spirit of Satan himself. And he said, I, he will exalt himself and then stand against the prince of princes. But it will be by deceit that he brings what will seem to be, and everybody will rejoice because this man will orchestrate through policy a peace treaty with Israel. Daniel 7.25 And he shall speak great words against the Most High. This is the Antichrist. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. That's Sharia law. He's, he wants to change the laws of this country. Now in, in America there are regions and, and this is happening in, uh, in England already where there are areas where the Muslim people, Islamic people have an enclave and they've said in our enclave we want to operate by our law, Sharia law rather than the law of the constitution of the country. And they've allowed it and they've endorsed it in England. They're already enclaves that they're not even responsible for. They're moving towards that in America to have a separate system of laws. But this Antichrist, this Imam, this Mahdi, it will be his goal to shift and change the laws of the planet to come under Sharia law, which is obviously, again, demonic. But he's going to wear out the saints of the Most High God, and they shall be uh, given into his hands until a time and a times and a dividing of times. Now this is a reference to the last seven years of the great, uh, the tribulation years. The tribulation years are divided into two sections. The first three and a half years and the last three and a half years. The first three and a half years are very difficult years. 
they are problematic years. And then the second section of those years goes deeper into and then we have the outbreak of God's judgment. During that time, this Antichrist will turn his anger, his wrath against the saints of God who are ever on the planet. You know, it's my hope that we go up before the whole thing breaks out. Are you with me? Say amen. We, we, we don't want to, we would rather not be here when all of this is transpiring. But there are sufficient scriptures that would indicate potentially that we're going to still be around for at least the first part of those seven years, the first three and a half, potentially. Now, I'm not locked in. I can, sh I can prove it either way. So I say, here's the key, that we are, everybody say, ready. ready. So if you're not ready, then there's, a, then there's an, uh, an issue. Given the times we live in, how much more shall we be watchful? Marvin Rosenthal, who, whose uh, magazine is called Zion's Hope, great Jewish believer for many, many years. He's the man who, uh, who is the inspiration behind uh, the Holy Land uh, area down in, uh, in Orlando. The Holy Land experience. We've been down there a number of years ago and it's still there. He developed all of that. Great, great guy. Here's what he writes in his, in his uh, Straight from the Heart. Marvin Rosenthal <coughs> wrote, read a, uh, wrote a book which I read and was very inspired by. It's called The Pre-Wrath Rapture of the Church. If you're looking for something to read and understand, that's a very, very good book. Here's what he writes. The moral fiber of my beloved America is cascading down like a tumultuous avalanche and there is no stopping it. I respect and appreciate my brothers and sisters in Christ who are crying out and praying for national repentance and revival. But sadly, I believe as a nation we have passed the point of no return. It is not a question of what can God do, but what God will do. We have reached the level of what it was like in the days before the Noahic flood. And I think I'm, I am on that same page. It does not, you, it's difficult to imagine a great, you know, revival taking place in America, given the place where we're at. It's almost like the Titanic. You say, well, you know, that Titanic could have stayed afloat if one compartment, front compartment, was filled, two, three, or four, but not five. The designer of that ship went down into the bowels of that boat and he looked at the situation and he came out of the bowels of the boat and he looked to the captain. He said, it's finished. Five, five compartments are gone. He said, there's no way of bringing it back. Now that Titanic, a very powerful prophetic picture, I believe, of America. When you get to a certain point, you just can't come back anymore. You can't have $18 trillion of debt and believe, well, we're going to somehow pay that off and everything is going to be hunky-dory when you are when you are printing $85 billion more every month and you're paying off your debt with your, with your printing press. Not to mention the moral decay, the abortions, the same-sex marriage, and the list goes on and on. And there's no sense of conviction from the higher levels of our nation uh, down even in the church, unfortunately. That's his comment on that. On the next page, let's go into a few scriptures. 2 Timothy 3.5 says this, For although, and this is where we are currently, I think in the church, by and large, they hold a form of piety, of true religion, but they deny and reject and are strangers to the what? To the, to, to the, say the power. The power of it. Their conduct belies the genuineness of their profession. And it says, avoid all such people and turn away from them. I was just reading that in the Presbyterian Church, for example, just last week, they've just accepted same-sex marriages and are saying within their church that now the church can marry, you know, same-sex sex. It's, a, it's, it's fine with them. And there's going to be a great split, but that's the demise of the Presbyterian movement uh, USA. There's something called the Emergent Church Movement that's infiltrating most of the denominational churches. And the basic uh, concept behind that is, is framed in the, in the one vocabulary word of tolerance. In other words, all truth is relative in what you believe and what the guy down the street believes. It's all truth. Somehow it's truth. In order to be right with God, you just have to believe 
believe what you believe, even if it's false. That's the, that's the emergent uh, church philosophy, and we could, we've taken time with that in other sessions. He said, this is going to be in the church world, and that's where the, that's where the caution comes. God's going to shake everything, and if we're not focused on truth, and not only knowing the truth, but embracing the truth, believing the truth, and living the truth, then we're going to be living in some level of deception. There are many people who have a belief system, but it's only intellectual. They've, they've not had it in their heart yet. They've not had the heart change, the heart transplant. And because of that, they are easily going to be deceived in these final days. 2 Timothy 4.3 For the time is coming when people will not tolerate or endure sound and wholesome instruction, but having ears itching for something pleasing and gratifying, they will gather to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable number chosen to satisfy their own liking and to foster the errors they hold. Now you take some time with that scripture and, and understand the implications of it. In the end times, people would say, I want certain teachers, but I want the teachers that are going to make me feel good. I, I want people to say things that agree with me. I don't want anything to challenge me. I just want to feel good. And let me tell you, there are plenty of folks out there who will give you a self-help program, and the whole desire it is it, it, the desire of the message is to tell you what you can have and what you can get and what God will do for you. Rather than the message of sacrificing ourselves before the Lord, we are living sacrifices and we live at His beck and call. And we declare this, that we've been bought with a price. We're no longer our own. We're servants of the Most High God. We do believe, obviously, that God wants us to, will take care of us. And He'll provide for our needs over the end times. And we say, Hallelujah, and thank you, Lord, for that. But there will be a doctrine that many people will get to that television. And they'll find that person who's saying something that they agree with. That they want to hear. That will tickle their ears. It's not a challenging word. It's not a word that will pull them out of their despair or their addiction. It'll be a word that just designed to make you somehow feel that you're a better person and it's deception at its roots. The other thing it's going to do it, on TV, they're picking the pockets of many Christians, getting them to write checks to them because of some kind of benefit they will get if they send money to them. Don't have time to go through all of that. But you, you and I have to be careful of how we listen, what you listen to. I had a, an occasion, and it was just happened the other, uh, yesterday, I was reading, a uh, matter of fact, it was in this writing. Uh, I had somebody, I was teaching on the end times, and they, they said, I don't think it was the true reason, but they said, we're, we're leaving the church because uh, it's too scary, and it's too, uh, it's too negative. You'd, see, this would be a negative message. This is negative. It's really not negative because it's calling us to a higher place. They, their response is, it's too negative. Uh, there was a, a, a woman who wrote this fella, uh, Marvin Rosenthal. His last magazine had a number of beasts on it. It was the beasts of, Re of Daniel and Revelation. And, uh, and the person wrote and they said, well, I'm, I'm not going to get the next subscription because it, it scared me. It scared me, so I'm not going get, to get it anymore. Now, that means you have to get rid of the book of Revelation. You've got to get rid of that one, and you've got to get rid of Matthew 24. That's a scary one. You see, you got to get rid of a good part of the book of Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel, and the list goes on. This is not scary because God takes care of the details. Is that right? Yeah. Let me let me read something to you. Do you have time? Yeah. You do? Oh, Dan does. Okay, good. Well, see. listen to this. Because this is, a, I think, this is defines much that we might find in uh, related to America. Because I have called you and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes, when your terror, notice terror, that word translated in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in Hebrew, guess what it is? Hamas. Hamas. When the terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then you'll call on me, but I'm not going to answer. 
They will seek me diligently, but it's too late. You'll not be, I'll not be found. Because they only want me in the time of difficulty. He said, I'm not coming just because things are bad. And all of a sudden, you, you want me to deliver. He said, I'm not, I'm not showing up. Because they hated knowledge. They did, not, they did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel. They despised my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Now to me, that defines potentially the status of the, of the American people who are birthed by God, blessed by God, honored by the Lord, set us in a place of great prominence throughout the planet, and we just denied Him. We say, you're getting out of our schools, you're getting out of our government, we don't want anything part of you. And then we have lawyers saying we're going to take down that, that cross, that, those two beams that were formed when the, when the towers fell. And they, they have a lawsuit to get that cross beam out of that museum. Now you think about that. Look at the last verse. He said, that's bad. You mean that's us? Yeah, that's bad. Here, here's, the, here's the good news. Verse 33 says this. Here's the good news. I'm going to lift you right out of your, your problem right here. But whosoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without the fear of evil. Everybody say hallelujah right there. See, all this is... The, when God is dealing with the nation, He said, I, I'm going to deal with those who have rejected me. You didn't want me? He said, fine, in your life. He said, but there's an outcome. A decision has a consequence. You reject, you choose to not follow in the ways of the Lord. There is, there is a consequence to that. Going on, the final great shaking, Hebrews 12, 27. And this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. That's us. That's the true believer. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. There it is. He said, we are now receiving, as you are diligent to study the Word, to come and hear the Word, to study God's Word, to pray. He said, you are, what, I'm, what God is building right now in His church is an immovable force. These are people who are so focused in, they're laser beam on their love for God. They're not, they don't do religion. They don't just, they're not churchgoers. They're passionate about God. The deception is this, I'm okay in the status I am. And, and we think what we're, if we just go to the church here and there and do a little lay me down, that's, that's not going to be enough in the end times. Because the power of the events that are going to take place on this planet will require a depth of faith that has never been known before in history. That's the warning. We're receiving that kingdom that cannot, the kingdom of God in us will not be shaken. If that kingdom of God is not being built in you, you will go down with the ship. You put your faith in that boat. You say, this thing is so big and you know, every, look, look at all this. No, it's, it's going down. Where, where's the safety? It's in the safety boat. That little dinghy thing over there that says, lifesaver. That represents Jesus. It doesn't look like much, but that's where your safety is. Amen? Amen. Romans 13, 11. Awake, put on the armor, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore... Cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. There's good instruction. I want to move quickly because I, want to, I know we're, we're going to get late. We don't want to, uh, our friends to miss anything this morning. Colossians 3, 1 through 5. It's called seek, set, and mortify. If you then being risen with Christ, this is the believer, he says, now here's what you do. Here's your instruction for the end times. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the Father. 
Set your affections. Everybody say that. Set your affections. It's seek Him. Set your affections. On what? Things that are above. Not on things that are on this for you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God when Christ who is our life appears then shall you also appear with him in glory therefore mortify dead and deprive of power your members which are upon the earth he said this is seeking this is what the true believer is about so I'm, a, I'm a God seeker we don't seek the things of this world I mean, you may look trying to get a career, and that may be part of your life. You need, to, you need to earn money. That's fine. But that's not my primary goal in this life. It's not about this earth. This whole thing is folding down. It's going to be shaken. It's going to go to, to ruin. He said, my heart is fixed on that one. It's almost like being married. You know, you have to set your affections on that one that's betrothed to you, that one that you're married to can't have your affection set on three and four other women or men. So no, there's one I seek. And that must be our, our desire of our passion of our heart. Setting our mind on the things above. You say, how do I do that? Here they are. This is, this is heaven. This is how the kingdom works. You know how many people I've talked to in my counseling practice? How much of the Bible do you read? I don't read the Bible. You're, you, are, you will set your affections on this world. I'm sorry, but you will. Because your passion will be set on something. And if it's not the Lord, by default, it will be on this world. You'll be after wealth, possessions. You'll be after a career. You'll be after a spouse. You'll be after something. But your first primary passion will not be the Lord. That's the problem. There is a choice that we make in this life. Is that I, I'm a Jesus man. I'm a Jesus woman. It's, I, it's in Him that I live and move and have my being. Without Him is nothing. There's no reason. There's no purpose. Why do I live? Except it is to live for Him. And whatever I do, it says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. If you want to be a good worker, do it as unto the Lord. It says, when you work, do it as unto the Lord for His glory. If you're going to choose a mate, do it for the glory of God, not because of your whatever. Hallelujah. Proverbs 28, 5. Evil men understand not judgment. They're not going to understand what's going on. They'll think it's all just politics. It's geopolitical. But they that seek the Lord understand what? He said, I'll show it to you. He said, you seek me. I'll show you where we are, what's going on. I'll give you the wisdom to understand it. Philippians 3. Many walk of whom I have told you often. He's talking about believers. Now I tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Notice. Whose end is destruction. Who God is their belly. And whose glory is in their shame. Who do what? They mind. You watch that TV. Those people will have you, you focus on what you can get out of God. That distorted prosperity gospel is going to set your affections on the things of this world. There's a true prosperity message. It just means to succeed in what you do for the Lord. But they will twist that into getting things out of this world system. To get houses, to get cars. I was just one of the most popular women preachers on TV. Million dollar homes all across the, all across the nation. And for her children. And down in Florida. Just sucking in the money and spending it on themselves. And if you knew their lifestyle, you'd just freak out with airplanes and everything else, cars and houses. Does God have anything against us having a decent place to live and whatever? No. But when my goal is the things of this world, I am in deception right there. And when that mark of the beast comes in, you can't buy or sell without that mark. And you're so, you're so consumed with having out of this life, you say, give me the mark. It'll be self-preservation. You know what some people think the mark is? He said it's on your forehead or it's in your hand, but that can be translated on your arm. Did you ever see the marching in the parades in the Middle East, the Hamas and those terrorist groups? They've got a banner, they've got a, 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 a bandana around their head or it's around their arm. Isn't that true? I, heard, I read this, I said, where are they? You know what it says on the bandana? Allah alone is God. That's what it says. Now you think about that. Allah is Satan. If you look through the, you can just study it out. 
It's not God, right? Here's the thing. So the, the largest ministers right now in America are saying Allah and Jehovah are the same. Major deception. Don't fall for it. Allah is Satan. Amen. That's what he is. Allah doesn't tell his followers to slaughter innocent people and chop their heads off. Would you agree with me? In America, largest churches, 20, 30,000 people, and they're already saying these are the same. Just a guy in a big mega church in Australia. You probably know it. It was called Hillsong Church, John Houston. And I will listen to the I'll listen to the tape. I'm watching him, and he says, Allah and God are one. Deceive to the max. Deceive to the max. Because you know what they're going to say eventually. It's it's a, the, the religion of peace. How many know that's a lie from hell? Amen. I mean, if that's a religion of peace, you know, oh, there's an, a separate group. What what Quran are they reading out of? Because it says to, to slaughter the the infidels. Hallelujah. Watch therefore, Luke 21, 30. Watch therefore and pray always. Everybody say, watch ye. Watch ye. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to what? Oh, I like that. Everybody say, escape. Escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of God, Son of Man. Now, I don't know if the escape is that kind of escape, a rapture, or I'm some, God is going to take care of us in the midst of the chaos that He's going to take care of us. I just know this, God's going to take care of us. Now, is it true that there have been a lot of Christians who have died the, life, uh, the, the, the death of a martyr? Yes. Now, I don't know, you know, that's another thing. A lot of people have been martyred. And they're under the altar saying, how long, Lord? How long? How long? If I go the way of the, you know, if I'm going to go, chopping the head off is a pretty swift way to go. And I'm not signing up, mind you. Matthew 24, 44. Therefore, be also what? Ready. Be ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Everybody say he's coming. he's coming. These things are transpiring. That we're, you and I are going to see some of the most incredible breakdown, shakings, that you can imagine. We're going to see weather patterns that are going to be, they're going to call it global warming. It's not global warming. Those earthquakes and these weather patterns are part of the judgment of God. See it, see it. And they will bring us in America to our knees. We think we're so great, we're so big, we've got all this stuff. We, we can't even fight a war. We've been such debt. We're gone. That's like you being, you know, $100,000 in debt and you think, well, now I've got some problems, some medical problems, and what am I going to do now? I don't have any more credit. You're done. There's, there's no option. That's where we've come to. Now here, J.C. Ryle, in finishing this message, said this. And he said, the great preacher of him from some years back. And I get this, uh, a newspaper. The Herald of His Coming, and they deal with some heavy subjects. And I want, you to, I want you to just get this, and I want you to read this. Here's what he said some years ago on being ready, given the time that we live in. He said, live as if you thought that Christ might come at any time. Do everything as if you did it for the last time. Say everything as if you said it for the last time. Read every chapter in the Bible as if you did not know whether you would be allowed to read it again. Pray every prayer as if you felt it might be your last opportunity. Hear every sermon as if you would not hear another one forever. Would you want to live that way? Or are you satisfied in mediocrity? I said, oh, I'm just good. I just want a little bit of, I just want a little dabble, do you? Just a little anointing. I just want a little, boop, boop, boop. That's it. You know when they anointed the, the, the kings and all that, historically? You know what they did? They, they took a, a vase, a picture of oil, and they poured on their head. They said the oil runs down from the head, all through down his garments, poured out anointing. How much is good enough for you? Could you come to the place and say, that's enough Jesus for me. I, I just don't want any more of that Jesus. Because I've got a life to live. I, I've got things to do after all, you know. And I hope he doesn't come soon because 
I want this and that out of this life. You're gone. You're finished. It'll never, work. It'll never bring you through, ever. This message is so radical, so consuming, that very few people will embrace it and say, that's where I'm going. You see that R.J. Ryle? You live every day like it's your last day. Would you live that way? Good question for us all. Let's pray. Amen. Father, we, uh, we look to you and we ask God that you would enlighten our hearts. That we would come to that place, Lord, that we know that there is no other answer in this life. There's nothing else, Lord, that's more important than knowing you. Lord, that you would impart to each one here, Lord, those who are seekers, they've set their heart on you, Lord. They are God's seekers, Lord, that you would meet that need. I want you to stand with me this morning to pray.